It's often not the destination which matters most, but what we discover of God and of ourselves on the journey. That's what stays with us and shapes us into fuller people. Ordinary time. Ordinary, yes, but perhaps not quite so ordinary as we softly tread in the footsteps of Jesus. And in the unexpected twists of a well-spun parable and the turns of lives redirected anew towards God, we embrace the adventure, growing taller yet. Hello and welcome to Windows on Worship. My name's Carl and it's good to have you with us, especially if you're tuning in for the first time. You're really welcome. This week we're looking at a very difficult passage from Mark's Gospel in which Jesus was questioned by some religious leaders who were looking to trip him up about his attitudes to divorce. All of it taking place in a context where women were often treated like property to be discarded at will by men. Before we begin to delve into this difficult subject matter, however, if you haven't done so already, you may find it helpful to download the worship sheet that accompanies this act of worship. You can find the link for that just below the video in YouTube, but you may need to click on show more in order to reveal it. The front side of the worship sheet has some space for you to make your own notes as we go along, some questions for you to ponder along the way, and various places where you're invited to share your thoughts and prayers with others in the comments section, particularly if you're watching the premiere and can use the live chat function in YouTube. The reverse side of the worship sheet contains the jukebox playlist, a set of YouTube videos chosen especially to help you go further in your praying and pondering through the week. And so as we come together before God in our different places, we bring our opening prayer. The words of this prayer, and indeed the words of all the prayers that we'll be joining in together today, will be on the screen. Please join in with those words in yellow and bold type, either in your head or out loud, as you're most comfortable. Let us pray. God of adventure and growth, open our hearts, ready our minds, and fire our imaginations, so that as we gather together before you, use technology to connect with each other, and ponder the life-giving stories of Jesus, we might discover more of your goodness and be swept up by the Holy Spirit as she nurtures, disturbs and inspires us on our journey into fullness of life. Amen. Each week on Windows on Worship, we offer a starter for 10 question that's designed to get you thinking about the subject matter for the week. You may wish to share your response to this question with others, either using the live chat if you're watching the premiere or in the main comments section. Equally, you might just want to think about it by yourself and that's fine too. So this week's starter for 10 is, think of a time when you are asked a question by someone trying to catch you out. What did you do?
come now to our prayers of thanks and praise. During this time, if there's something you want to give thanks to God for and want to share that with others, please do type it into the comments or the live chat. Let us pray. God of all compassion, whose love runs deeper than we could ever imagine, we thank you for the grace that sets us free to truly live, for the forgiveness that enables us to begin again, for the comfort your Holy Spirit brings us in times of trial. As we look to you to guide and inspire us on our way, help us to love mercy, act justly and walk humbly with you, so that through us the world may know of your goodness. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who for our sakes opened his arms wide on the cross and embraced our hurting and messy world. Amen. The psalm that's set for this week is Psalm 8. If you want to follow the version that I'm using and have a copy of the Methodist hymn book, Singing the Faith, you can find that at number 801. But the words will be on the screen. Let us pray. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes, to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God, and crown them with glory and honour. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. As we come before God today, we recognise that the way our world works and the way we live our lives does not always reflect God's love as fully as it should. And with that in mind, we bring our prayers of renewal. Let us pray. God of renewal and fresh hope, we bring to you those things in our lives and our world in need of your refreshment and renewal. When we valued following the rules above following you, Christ forgive us. When we've lost sight of you amid the pressures of life, Christ refresh us. When we've been hurt by unjust rules or actions, Christ, comfort us. When systems and rules have been used to exclude or harm, Christ, rebuke us. And when your church has forgotten its reason for being, Christ, renew us.
God of renewal and fresh hope, thank you that you forgive us, renew us and set us free to live for you. Amen. Our reading for this week comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 1 to 16. As you hear it read, keep your ear open for any particular words or phrases or ideas that jump out at you. You may wish to note them down on your worship sheet, because these could point to the things God particularly wishes to say to you through the Holy Spirit today. Jesus left that place and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And crowds again gathered around him and, as was his custom, he again taught them. Some Pharisees came and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then, in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me, do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever doesn't receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. There is no question that this week's Gospel passage is particularly difficult to grapple with, as talking about divorce can provoke some very strong reactions. Some of you will think it is a good thing that the UK's divorce laws have been liberalised in recent decades, and indeed that instigating so-called no-fault divorces would remove the acrimony that often comes with having to have blame attributed to one partner. Others, perhaps citing texts such as today's reading, will think that divorce is wrong, except in cases of adultery and or abuse. And yet others will sit somewhere on the spectrum that exists between these two perspectives. Moreover, as well as this, almost everybody will know someone who's been trapped in a loveless marriage when divorce wasn't an option. Someone who's been through a difficult and messy separation following the discovery of their partner's adultery and betrayal, and someone who found legally ending their marriage to be a liberating experience. All of this serves to illustrate how divorce is both a complex and a highly emotive issue. What I think we can say about it, however, is that today's passage has been used down the years by some in the church to kind of push divorcees and their children to the margins of society. That fact goes a long way to explain the outrage that there was about the wedding of Boris and Carrie Johnson 
that took place in the Roman Catholic Westminster Cathedral, despite it being their relationship that led to Mr Johnson's previous divorce. That was something that many commentators found to be extremely hypocritical. This way the church has used the particular text that we're looking at today is symptomatic of a wider pattern that's been identified. The late feminist theologian Phyllis Tribble coined the famous term texts of terror when she was exploring the stories of women whose suffering is documented in the pages of the Hebrew scriptures. Over time, others have taken that expression, texts of terror, and applied it to passages that are frequently used to justify, in inverted commas, the oppression of various groups of people, along the lines of ethnicity, for example. Our reading for today has been described as a text of terror in relation to the subject of divorce, as some theologians have claimed that Jesus' reaction to the Pharisees prohibits divorce in all circumstances, even where adultery and or abuse has come into it. More recently, this same passage has been utilised by some to argue that same-sex couples should not be allowed to marry, and by many of the same people to deny the reality of trans people's experiences and reality. It therefore needs some very careful and considered handling if we're going to make sense of it. With this in mind, let's try and put the passage in a bit of context. Jesus, we're told in verse 1, was on the way to Jerusalem with his disciples and busily teaching the crowds that had gathered around him as he walked through Judea. In the process, a group of Pharisees who were seeking to test him came up to him and asked him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce his wife. Now we need to recognise, as we come to this text, that marriage was understood quite differently to how it's generally perceived in 21st century Britain. Nowadays, the vast majority of couples who get married marry primarily for love. But back in those days, love didn't always have very much to do with it. And marriage was primarily about property and status and honour between two families. And moreover, in a deeply patriarchal society, women were very often treated as the property of men, so that female sexuality was effectively separated from individual autonomy. When a woman got married, she was basically handed over from her father to her husband and had very little in the way of rights or status of her own. All of that meant that divorce would often leave women extremely vulnerable in an age where societal structures kept them dependent upon men. And in some cases, some extreme cases, being divorced was effectively a death sentence for the woman. Now, bearing in mind all of that background, it's important to note that when the Pharisees asked Jesus their question, at the heart of their sense of testing him was a really fiery debate going on within Judaism about what constituted appropriate grounds for divorce. There were differences between Jewish approaches and Greco-Roman approaches. So, for example, in Judaism, only the man could initiate a divorce, whereas in the wider culture that Jesus and his contemporaries inhabited, it could be the woman as well. But the debate within Judaism centred on a particular scripture from Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4. That makes provision for a man to be able to legally divorce his wife upon finding, and I quote, something objectionable about her. Although it has to be said the context for this is the prohibiting of the same couple to remarry if the wife, having been given a divorce certificate, has gone on to marry another man. The man issuing the wife with a certificate of divorce gave the woman a degree of protection in a context where being suspected of having had children outside of wedlock 
could lead to someone being killed. Something that I don't think Jesus' um, questioners really kind of took seriously when they raised this question about a hypothetical couple. And this highlights the reason, I think, that Jesus in verse 5 accuses them of being hard-hearted. Essentially, their response is entirely theoretical. There's a lack of compassion for the dilemmas faced by women in that situation. So what could constitute something objectionable enough to permit a man to seek divorce? Well, there was a wide range of views, and it takes us to the very heart of a debate between two major rabbinical schools of thought. For Rabbi Hillel, appropriate grounds to divorce could include basically anything, really trivial things like once burning the husband's dinner. Well, for Rabbi Shimei, adultery was the only adequate reason for getting a divorce. It seems, in Mark's portrayal of this passage at least, that Jesus takes a stricter stance, even than that very conservative position of adultery is the only valid grounds for divorce. And Jesus draws on the creation narratives from Genesis 1 and 2 to claim that divorcing is effectively tearing apart what God has joined together. And yet, and yet I think it's really important to say that he wasn't in this seeking to see people forevermore trapped in misery, in loveless or even abusive marriages. What he was doing, I think, and this is where our context and background is so important, was looking to protect women in a culture where too often they were treated as sort of discardable items, as property that men could just throw away. And certainly Rabbi Hillel's take on it, as you could divorce your wife for something as trivial as burning the dinner, kind of supports that um, sense that there was a need to um, protect women as people who were deeply vulnerable in that scenario. In other words, then, what I think Jesus was doing here was consciously aligning himself with those who were pushed to the margins of society by the ways that it so often worked. And this point is reinforced by what happens in verses 13 to 16 of our passage, where Jesus shows care for young children after he's given his disciples a private explanation of his teaching to the Pharisees. The disciples, just as they had sadly done previously, sought to stop the children coming to Jesus. In other words, they sought to keep another group who were lacking in status away from him. But Jesus rebuked them and he made it very clear that receiving the kingdom of God is to be done in the same way that we need to welcome a child such as one of the ones being brought to him. And he was thus modelling God's care for people on the margins, just as we are called to do today in our context, while taking seriously how different the society that we're doing this in is to that of first century Judea out of which this passage comes. As part of my role as a Methodist minister, I have prepared a good many couples for marriage or for the blessing of their marriage. And I can honestly say that nobody I have encountered has gone into such a union intending for it to end up in divorce, despite what some now say about it being too easy to go back on the commitments you make when you exchange vows and rings. It is true that marriage, as the preface to the Methodist Marriage Service says, is a lifelong commitment. But also we must, and I hope do, recognise that real life doesn't always work itself out in ideal terms and things do sometimes go wrong. As the child of a woman whose first marriage had failed and someone who ended up being baptised in the local Methodist chapel because the Church of England turned my mother away. I am very strongly of the view that compassion must be what fundamentally shapes the church's attitude to divorce, to people who've been divorced and the children affected by those situations. We must not continue to take passages like that we've heard today and shape them into texts of terror 
out of a spirit of judgment, of looking down upon those whose marriages, for whatever reason, haven't worked out. Yes, it's true that divorce will always be a complicated and emotive subject. And it doesn't change the fact that we need to respond well, pastorally, compassionately to those who experience it, if we're going to model God's love in these situations. So as we go forward into the rest of the week and continue to ponder this really challenging text, I pray that it will indeed be compassion and love that shapes our response to it and those who find themselves in those sorts of situations today. Amen. Each week on Windows on Worship, we suggest a resource that you may find helpful as you look to go deeper in your praying and pondering. This week's resource is a spiritual classic. It's by Henri Nuon and it's called The Wounded Healer. It's a book that highlights, given we've been thinking, I guess, about human brokenness, how often it's our woundedness that actually enables us to minister effectively to others. It's owning our vulnerability and being able to be appropriately vulnerable that enables us to care pastorally and compassionately for one another. So in the light of what we've been thinking about today, I think it's an excellent book for lay and ordained alike to read and to grapple with. So that's Henri Nuance, The Wounded Healer. We come now then, friends, to our prayers of intercession, our prayers for others. If there's something that you'd like to share as a prayer request, do type that as we pray into the comments or the live chat. But as usual, if you're going to make reference to an individual, please just use their initials. As we reflect on the messiness and tangledness of the real world that we inhabit, and we lay the things that we're aware of in that world before God, we're going to watch some footage of a tangle of wool being run through um, someone's hands. And if you happen to have a ball of wool, you might like to do the same sort of thing as you use this time as we watch this footage and listen to quiet music to reflect on those tangled and messy situations in our world in need of God's love and transformation at this time. 
Let us pray. So as we bring together everything that we've been thinking and praying about today, please join me in saying the words of the family prayer that Jesus taught us in whatever language or form is most familiar to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Windows on Worship this week. I hope you found this act of worship helpful and thought provoking. If you're not already a subscriber to Windows on Worship and would like to be, do click the subscribe button that will pop up in the middle of the screen at the end of this video. A link to the jukebox playlist and another video that you may like to engage with will also pop up towards the end of the video. And don't forget that on the worship sheet you will find some bible study questions to explore as well as a reminder of this week's suggested resource finally hit the thumbs up the like button if you found this act of worship helpful but for now as we come to the end of our time together for this week a prayer of blessing let us pray god of all our journeys as we go forward into the rest of the week, may you be the light to our path and the breath we breathe. And may the blessing of the Father, the Son and the Spirit be with us and those whom we love and pray for now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.